All right, guys, I think we're going to get started now. So we have a very special Grand Rounds prepared today. It's on the topic of wellness and academic medicine. It's, when the, it's a topic that I feel like, personally, it's very important because reducing physician burnout you know, will allow us to really provide the best care for all of our patients. Um, so we have the pleasure of having Dr. Robin Marcus. She's actually the chief wellness officer at the university. Um, come to speak to us. We also have our very own Dr. Ord, Lisa Ord, as well as Dr. Griffin Jardine, who will be speaking to us about this topic as well. Uh, to jumpstart the session, I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, Olson to come up and share a few words. So this whole area of burnout <clears throat> is a national epidemic. And if you look at your numbers, you, you follow these, you want to say, is it getting better, is it getting worse? It's getting worse. 10% increase nationally over the period of just the last few years. A whole host of reasons, but this just has to be addressed seriously. And I want everybody to know from the top that I am very concerned about this, that I am very interested, that we do everything we can to make sure that people have appropriate work-life balance and all the tools and the rest in place to help with what they do. Uh, we've got an incredible individual who's willing to be the champion for this. Griffin Jardine has taken this on with incredible enthusiasm and excitement. We are unbelievably fortunate, uniquely fortunate to have Lisa Ward in our, in our department who has both the skill set and the desire and the interest to help us in regards to this. I, I, I know that we have an issue of making sure exactly where we are and because, based on this we did get a this time a very very complete survey so that we're going to report to you exactly where we are as a department. Ian Griffin is going to present that so you, you have that in place. But we want to make sure everybody knows that we have all the resources available. Robin is a champion of this, and she's amazing at what she's doing. And then she's got further backup with all she's going to present and put in place. And then we're going to regularly be talking to people about the tools and the rest they need. This is at every level. This is, at, this is at residence level, this is at fellows level, this is at faculty level. So this is something that we all are engaged in and we all need to help and support each other to recognize that uh, this, is, this is bad for us, this is bad for our patients, this is bad for our families in that uh, we want people to be excited about what they're doing and where they're engaged in. With that, I'll turn it over to my good friend Robin. Robin, tell us about this. Thank you, Dr. Olson, Dr. Jardine. I, I really appreciate um, being asked to come and, and share uh, just a few minutes with you before we hand it off to uh, the other two speakers. So I, I want to let you know, first of all, um, I'm, I'm just going to give a little background information to follow up with what Dr. Olson said. Um, provider wellness, and I, I'm going to start with provider wellness, but um, forgive me, but I'm not going to end with provider wellness, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the whole team. But I want to talk about provider wellness because it's a little bit about what we know about with the literature. Um, you all know about the triple aim. Well, the fourth aim uh, is uh, taking care of the team of people that actually uh, are responsible for the triple aim. And um, you know, we, we've identified this, uh, we're actually looking for a little bit better graphic, but this is what I have right now. So what we really want to talk about is how important it is and how our uh, institution recognizes the importance of taking care of yourselves um, so that you can take care of others. Um, so that's, that's something that I think is, is uh, as Dr. Olson said, really coming from the top down um, at this institution. So the outer circle there really is clinician and also staff and team satisfaction, wellness, resilience, all the other words we're going to use to talk about that. So let me talk to you a little bit about uh, what we know about uh, national burnout rates. I kind of hate to start this talk with burnout. I'd rather actually talk about resilience, which I think is a, is a more positive way to, to look at this. But you can't talk about this without talking about burnout. You can't open the, um, the you know, Time magazine without talking about physician burnout these days. So uh, we know quite a bit about um, observations of, of physician perceived burnout. And residents are, uh, in particular, uh, residents are affected by this. Uh, 50 to 75 percent of people across, uh, residents across the country are identifying themselves as being burnt out. 
Um, physicians are also above 50 percent, and as Dr. Olson pointed out, this is particularly scary because it has seen an increase of 10 percent in a relatively short amount of time, and really there's no indication that this is decreasing at this point. Again, I want to say we know that all healthcare professionals are at risk, and in our institution, um, we really have an institution-wide um, initiative to address this. So a little bit about our own data. Um, the, uh, we have a, a uh, let me just give you a little bit of history. So we put together a GME um, wellness committee about a year ago. And over that period of time, it's a very multidisciplinary committee, and over that period of time, uh, we initially started um, with a resident and fellow survey. That was quite an extensive survey. Some of you in here probably took that survey. And uh, we actually hired uh, a wonderful clinical psychologist who now is the director of GME Wellness, who's part of our team. And what we identified in that initial survey was that about 46 percent of residents were self-identifying as burnt out. And another, and, and about fewer, but 23 percent of the fellows on that same survey were identified, self-identified as burnt out. And then uh, there was another survey that we did with the faculty. Uh, where we identified that about 30 percent of our faculty across the system, and this was, uh, I think we had an N of about 608 people take this survey, so it's not all of our physicians, but this was a physician survey, faculty survey. And the important point here is that uh, 30 percent we think represents, is, is actually very conservative because it was representing only one piece of burnout which is emotional exhaustion. So um, on surveys where you're looking at a few different pieces of burnout, those numbers are expected to go up. So it correlates with burnout. Um, you could probably tell me um, right in the room, but what we know from the literature is one of the number one things is a sense of control and autonomy in what you do. Um, we also know that regulatory requirements are, are affecting um, provider uh, levels of burnout. Um, productivity pressure as well. Uh, work hours and, and, and not only the number of work hours, um, and that isn't directly correlated with burnout, interestingly, um, but the flexibility of those work hours is, is very much correlated uh, with burnout. Uh, whether you perceive what you're doing is important and appreciated by your superiors is also uh, highly correlated um, with burnout. And then things that, that are in my wheelhouse, like you know, whether you eat well, whether you sleep well, whether you get enough physical activity, those are things that are also associated with burnout. Uh, your stress level, uh, whether you're satisfied with your job, and I will tell you that in our survey that we did here, um, we have very, very high job satisfaction, and we still have a relatively significant, uh, you know, large amount of burnout. So in our survey in particular, um, uh, just because you were satisfied with your job did not mean that you were not uh, self-identifying as, as burnt out. But nationally, that does seem to be uh, an issue. And then, uh, importantly, team function. And we, we have found that um, to be significantly correlated with, with uh, people's self-perceived burnout. So failure to respond, and I probably don't have to tell you about this, um, but when I talk to leadership, um, we really push this because it is very, very important that we respond to this. As Dr. Olson said, um, we know that burnout is associated with poor medical outcomes. So poor outcomes of the patients that you see, um, that's very important. It's also associated with patient satisfaction. Um, uh, the disruptive behaviors that are associated with burnout are something that um, colleagues have to deal with. It's significant. Um, productivity, lack of empathy, those are important things. Uh, satisfaction and engagement, again, um, the, the numbers here speak loudly to people that are concerned with costs. And I put this number up here because uh, we used to say, when I first started doing this talk, when we looked in the literature, we tried to find as much information as we could, and we used to say that it cost about $250,000 to replace a physician. And actually, the most recent data is suggesting that if we include both the indirect costs and the direct costs of replacing a physician in an academic medical center, it approaches close to a million dollars. So if we lose a physician because of burnout, 
not only is it a terrible thing for them personally, and I don't mean to say that I put that down low because it's not important, it's extremely important. The personal consequences of burnout are very important, but our system's consequences and the financial consequences of burnout are very important. So we don't uh, neglect to, to mention that now. Uh, and then finally, and again, I put this last more uh, to emphasize it um, because the, the very real personal consequences of burnout um, are something that we're all very concerned about. So this is hot off the presses. Um, the uh, organizational plan uh, value kind of roadmap for fiscal year 18. And um, the reason that I put this up is if we look at this, I guess I have a, well, maybe I don't, it's okay. Um, if you look at this uh, slide, you can see obviously the patient experience, quality, and financial strength. Those are our main areas uh, that where goals are written for our organizational plan. And um, this year we have provider experience and wellness uh, workforce planning, employee engagement, and clinical support down in the lower left-hand corner of this. Those are all very much related to having a staff and faculty that is not burned out. Um, so, you know, and, and you can actually look across here. There are several of these, um, uh, these issues that can be and should be addressed by keeping our employees, our faculty, our staff, your teams well and satisfied. And so I think that um, this wasn't there if you looked at the fiscal year 17 or 16. It wasn't, it, it's starting to come in and now it's very explicitly identified um, on our, uh, our roadmap to success for the institution. So I think that's a good, that's a very good sign. So um, I'm going to talk to you just briefly about uh, where a lot of this work has gone. So I told you that GME, about a year ago, we established a committee, and that ended up with us having a GME wellness um, director now. And about at the same time, we brought together a group, uh, again, a, a very interdisciplinary group of individuals to start talking about physician, and I will say physician, because that's where it started out, physician wellness and resiliency. And basically what we were talking about around the table was what can we do to prevent what we know might be inevitable if we don't do something? And that is really, really terrible outcomes, not only patient outcomes, but personal outcomes for our physicians because academic med medicine, medicine in general is hard and hard things happen. And we need to address this. So this was a group of people that came together across the system, including risk management, my office, uh, the faculty affairs office, uh, and, and others. And the result of this was, uh, over about a three-month period of time, was we decided that we wanted to go to leadership to propose a resiliency center. Um, and that resiliency center, we decided by the end of this uh, about three month period of meeting, needed to address resiliency from more than the physician's perspective. The physician is very, very important, but the team was also very important. And so the resiliency center um, was born, basically, and the resiliency center uh, is, is now a reality. And it is, um, we've identified um, certain pillars, and I'll talk about those in just a minute. But the Resiliency Center, we want to be a hub for coordinating um, and supporting our entire health system uh, relative to wellness and resilience. Um, it will bring together uh, undergraduate medical education, graduate medical education, uh, UUMG, there, there's Compassionate Workforce over at Huntsman. There are a lot of, of uh, moving pieces that we're trying to coordinate. And the three programmatic pillars that have been identified as being important to the Resiliency Center are listed here. So one is faculty and staff wellness initiatives I'll talk briefly about in a second. Uh, another one is a communication skills program and another one is a peer counseling program. Oh, and finally, sorry, there, we also are bringing on site uh, an EAP provider um, who will be here at the institution 40 hours a week. EAP, the um, uh, Employee Assistance Program, 
and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. So the, the first pillar being faculty and staff wellness initiatives, just to let you know. So what we're looking at is there are a lot of really great things. And, and just looking out here, what you guys are doing here is phenomenal. And we're not trying to obviously um, take that into the Resiliency Center, but we want to be able to help share the good work that's going on across the system and learn from, from each other and uh, start to provide what, what we think is best practices. So we want to uh, build capacity and support local innovation that's occurring with wellness in the departments um, and the clinics. We also want to uh, coordinate faculty and staff wellness initiatives um, that are uh, aimed at engagement and satisfaction, so we're working with HR um, as well. Um, and one of the things you'll be pleased about, I hope, is uh, we're trying to coordinate the number of surveys we send out <laughs> um, and um, try to figure out who's sending what and why, what information we're getting because right now it's a little bit confusing. So we're hoping to, to identify that. Um, one of the initiatives um, that we started about a year ago again was the Faculty Wellness uh, Champion Program and that will be coordinated under the Resiliency Center now as well. Uh, we hope to uh, have a coordinated approach to uh, mindfulness both at the individual level and at the team level because there are a lot of people doing a lot of good things in mindfulness, um, but we want to coordinate this so that um, we can share again what's working. Uh, we also, and importantly because we're an academic medical center, we want to track outcomes. We want to show impact uh, or not and change course if we're not having an impact. And um, we want to share um, uh, best practices across the health system, but also we want to be able to disseminate information across the country. So, uh, in fact, right now, my colleague, um, who is one of the associate directors of the Resiliency Center, is at the AMA in Chicago um, at a meeting uh, presenting some of this information. So, I mentioned the second pillar being a communication skills program. Um, it's pretty clear that communication skills um, are uh, both across the team, between team members, between um, team members and patients, um, the, the better we communicate, the less burnt out we seem to be and the more resilient we seem to be. So that's a very important piece. Um, we were, were planning on modeling this program off of a program that you're probably familiar with, which is the UCOPE program uh, in palliative care. Um, but we're, it's not going to be the exact same program. So we're trying to modify that program to meet the needs of our providers and the teams. And we really hope that, again, this is, there are a lot of communication programs going on across campus and what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring those together and coordinate uh, so that your, uh, as providers, you're not asked to go to six different communication programs so that we can, we can hopefully uh, coordinate our efforts here. The, the third pillar is a peer support program and um, very, very important uh, in preventing burnout and improving resilience, the ability to talk to someone like you who's going through the same thing. And whether that is a nurse to nurse or whether that is a doctor to doctor, um, we're hoping to build this program based on a, a pretty successful program that's currently working out of Stanford. Um, where we will train uh, people, uh, we'll train peers at our institution and have a group of people that are available to you when needed. And then finally I said that we're going to have a, uh, an EAP uh, individual on, on campus. So the Employee Assistance Program is great. Uh, we have a great um, benefit here. But oftentimes it's not used. And part of the reason why it's not used is because it's not here. Um, and so what we are, we're teaming with our EAP provider uh, and there'll actually be three different providers and they will be here early and late and part of the middle of the day for some direct crisis management, direct counseling, but more importantly they're going to be part of this team for prevention. Um, so it's not just you need to go see an EAP provider, hopefully this will be integrated into our the, the whole preventive uh, aspect of the Resiliency Center. So just to finish up here, I just have a couple more slides. Um, one of the things that I want to point out is we understand that um, resilience is not just telling you all to buck up and bounce back. Um, it is the system and the individual. 
And um, my role really is to champion this at the system level, to make sure that we're getting, we have the capacity and the ability to change the system. So what I thought was wellness two years ago, um, I had no idea that wellness was epic, okay? Um, but wellness is epic, and I understand that now. And um, not that I can change EPIC, but that's the role that you know, I can help play and, and the Resiliency Center leadership can help play. So this is not just at the individual level, although we think we can, we can offer more important and valuable in, uh, individual <coughs> programs. We need to address this so that at the individual, at the department, at the clinic level, at the, to fulfill our academic mission and at the health system level. And so many of the meetings that I've had have been with, you know, Howard Weeks, um, with Epic, uh, things that I never thought as a wellness professional that I would be doing. But I want you to understand that, that at least um, our, our leadership is, is understanding that. So the Resiliency Center will be in the HSEB, um, located just south, on the fifth floor, just south of Faculty Affairs. Um, importantly, we, they will also be electronically available. So even though we know that's across the street, it's across the street. Um, so they will be electronically available and they will also be on the road. So you can expect to see them and hopefully working with your providers over here. Um, we have two faculty co-directors who are terrific, uh, Amy Locke in, in uh, Department of Family and Preventive Medicine and Ellen Morrow in the Department of Surgery. Um, are leading the effort from the physician side. And then we have hired a new uh, clinical psychologist. Her name is Megan Call. She will hit the ground on May 1st, next Monday, here. Uh, and she is coming to us um, from Dartmouth, where she has been involved in their physician um, wellness uh, initiatives. I, don't, I can't tell you who the AP providers are yet, because we don't have names. So I'll just finish. Um, by saying that, you know, again, resilience is the capacity to respond to stress in a way such that goals are achieved at minimal psychological and physical costs. Resilient individuals bounce back after challenges while also growing stronger. But that's not, we don't just expect you to suck it up and bounce back. We're hoping to actually provide resources to help you. So I'll finish there and if you want to, any questions? Thank you.